Hi there, good evening and thank you so much for asking me to come and chat to you about birth trauma and its impact this evening. My name is Rachel and I volunteer with the Birth Trauma Association. I found this association seven and a half years ago when I experienced my own birth trauma. They navigated me through the most impossibly challenging time in my life to date and they became my port in a very turbulent storm of motherhood. As I gradually recovered, I became aware of quite the difference the intervention the Birth Trauma Association had made to my life, and I wanted to pay it forward. So I joined their committee, and during the past five years, I've volunteered with them. I've seen the need for our services grow exponentially, so I'm really grateful to be talking to you tonight a little bit about our organisation. So we were founded in 2004, we're a small charity mostly staffed by volunteers. We support women and the partners who are traumatised by birth and we work with policymakers on issues re relating to maternity care. We campaign on birth and maternity and we work to help make policies with various people. Now, post-traumatic stress after giving birth affects one in 25 women which is approximately 30,000 people a year. And this figure doesn't include partners. Symptoms of postnatal PTSD are shown here. I suffered particularly with hypervigilance and anxiety. I believed that we had cheated death and as such, in the manner of final destination, it was now following us. It was quite the most dreadful way to live imaginable. In the Birth Trauma Association, we see a range of causes of PTSD. The fact is that PTSD is completely subjective. We see women who have endured the most horrendous experiences, some resulting in a hysterectomy or other appalling health issues. And we see people who, for whatever reason, didn't get the immediate skin to skin or the newborn photographs they wanted, and they've been left traumatized as a result. If the person finds it traumatic, it is birth trauma. In summer 2020, we conducted a survey. This next slide illustrates which births our respondents found the most traumatic. You can see planned cesarean, emergency C-section with general anaesthetic, emergency section with epidural, the von twos, the forceps, and the unassisted. In terms of trauma, inducing difficulties intrinsic to birth, the following factors are by no means an exhaustive list, but are common factors in PTSD causation. We often hear the following psychological factors are involved in resultant trauma. People dream of their birth experience and many have expectations over what it's going to be like. To lose this hope and dream can result in terrible trauma. As midwives, your relationship with the patient can impact their response to a traumatic event, such as the need for an emergency section. One defining factor in PTSD that we hear of again and again is that staff didn't communicate, or there were procedures performed without consent. Many women remark that when having a vaginal examination, the midwife will say, Oh, I just did a sweep whilst I was examining you. My own experience was that I consented to a vaginal examination without realising what that actually entailed. I was very naive and as the doctor inserted her entire hand into my vagina, at that stage I immediately felt I'd lost all autonomy. At no point did I ever give informed consent to that. Next slide, thank you. We're now on causes of traumatic birth. Some further results of our survey are here. These factors are all indicated in causing traumatic birth. You can see they range from death to infection and use of instruments. The fear is tremendous. These results do not take into account the impact of COVID-19. And many, many people are now finding us due to trauma at having been left alone during labor as their partners were not allowed into the unit, having to attend significant appointments and scans alone, and then going to the hospital unaccompanied. These have all contributed to deeply traumatic birth experiences for many people. 
Next slide. The treatments for birth trauma. There are two main approved treatments for PTSD. The first is high intensity trauma focused CBT. And the second is EMDR. There are other treatments, for example, rewind therapy being tested, but they currently lack an evidence base. Now, moving on to the birth debrief slide. What many of our members tell us is that a birth debrief helped them process their experience and begin to move on from it. When this is done well and the trauma is acknowledged, people say it can reduce their negative feelings. The main point to reiterate is to please acknowledge and understand trauma. Now, moving on, how can you health professionals help? The most important thing is to please accept the person is traumatized. A healthy baby is not all that matters in terms of a mother's mental health. When asked about the birth, please don't demean the person's response by using phrases such as, well, at least you can, at least you and the baby got through it. Also, please learn to recognize the signs of trauma response and make the appropriate mental health referral if necessary. So many times PTSD is misdiagnosed as postnatal depression. The best way, moving on please to the next slide, the best way a midwife can help is to please be the change. You are incredibly powerful people when somebody is at their most vulnerable. You can be the difference between walking out of a hospital mentally well and walking out with PTSD. Always seek consent for procedures. Explain what is happening and why. Always listen. You will absolutely make the difference and bring a positive to the most important moment in a woman's life. Moving on, next slide, please. This slide is a quote from one of our members and it illustrates how one midwife made a difference to that lady's experience. She began to heal because she was finally heard. Now that's my slides all done, which is marvelous. But in order to further illustrate the impact a traumatic birth can have, I really need to touch briefly on my own experience, mm. if that's okay. Conceiving my twins was literally a case of throwing the kitchen sink at IVF. After seven years of multiple failed attempts and surgeries, my house remortgaged, countless credit cards maxed, getting two for the price of one small country left me incredibly elated, but I didn't dare to believe that effort had paid off. I couldn't be complacent. And it was only after 30 weeks that I started telling people the good news. And I still wish to this day that I'd known the hardest part was still ahead of us. At 34 weeks, I had what was dismissed by the midwife as Braxton Hicks contractions. I had also epically swollen hands, feet, ankles and fingers, but I was assured everything was fine. I ploughed through till 36 weeks and on the Monday morning, crippling pains started in my abdomen. I knew it wasn't normal, so I called the midwife explained to her what was happening and her response lasted 10 seconds. I'm on leave till Wednesday, Rachel. This is all part and parcel of being at the end of a twin pregnancy. I'll call you on Wednesday. So I felt really bad about bothering her while she was on leave and I took her dismissal as complete reassurance. I've always been deferential to healthcare professionals. They talk about choice and behaving like a consumer as much as a patient, but I'm a firm believer that five minutes on Google does not compete with medical training. And looking back now, oh, how I wish I'd been more of a complainer because the next horror story would have been avoided. The following day at 36 weeks and one day pregnant, I climbed into bed and I was feeling dreadful. I thought I felt my waters go, but when I looked down, I realized I was hemorrhaging. So I snatched the phone and I dialed 999 and within six minutes, I was loaded into an ambulance, lights and sirens blaring, the full works. The horror of this journey is literally etched into my memory forever. 
As we were driving, I was contemplating the very depth of cruelty that we've come this close to happiness. My babies were dead. How could they survive this? I lost three litres of blood during the ensuing C-section. I remember hearing things I couldn't respond to, like my blood pressure was just 80 over 40. The surgeon saying she was in grave danger of slipping in my blood. The anaesthetist saying she's not been stable for three minutes now. I wanted to tell them that my arm hurt, but I couldn't make myself heard. My husband alerted them as I lost consciousness. It transpired that a cannula was misplaced and they'd had a compression pump filling my arm with over a litre of Hartman's fluid, but instead of going into the vein, it was pooling under the skin. My husband Liam was sent reeling as the anaesthetist flew across to my other arm to inject me with ephedrine and attached tubes to the backup cannula in my wrist. More medication and fluid was apparently given through this site and I came round to hear, okay, that's baby number two, and there was a cry. They brought this baby round to me wrapped in a towel and said, you've got a son. Whilst trying to conceive, over the years I'd endured five miscarriages, I'd been through multiple failed IVF cycles, and I had dreamt so many times of hearing those words, you have her. Yet when they came, I felt nothing. There was no desire to see the baby, there was no joy, there was no interest. I found my attention focused on the fact that the midwife was covered from head to toe in my blood. And I sat there, lay there musing, why wasn't she wearing longer surgical gloves? My daughter was still being resuscitated and I didn't even ask about her. I was taken back to the labour unit and I spent the next three days being cared for there. There was no rush of maternal love. I was hit with a rush of diagnoses. I'd had a placental abruption. I had preeclampsia. I was in acute renal failure. I had blood pulled around my liver. So I embarked on a kidney challenge instead of breastfeeding. I didn't produce any breast milk, so without consulting me, the midwife started my children on formula. As soon as I was aware of this, I felt like I'd failed as a mother by failing to feed my children. When I was eventually deemed well enough to be moved to the maternity ward, I encountered a cavalier attitude from the staff there that I realised was cultural within the hospital. From the insistence by the midwife that I'd be left to fly solo and feed the twins overnight, despite having a totally untreated dehiscence to my section scar, to being left in a pool of my own blood for hours whilst the afternoon shift neglected to tell the evening shift that I, my scar had dehissed and I needed my sheets changed. Believe it or not, there was a 15 year old work experience girl whose mother was a psychologist at the hospital who'd got her the placement. She would stand in my room giving me a monologue on how bored she was, telling me that my daughter was by far the sickest baby on neonatal with her Rubin level of 379. So in my head, I made the leap that that was because I'd failed to breastfeed her. There was a student midwife who under the supervision of the same midwife who insisted I fly solo, whilst neglecting my dehis scar, left several stitches in my abdomen that weren't removed until months after the birth. I'll come to the consequences of this in a moment, but I've reached the point where the only word I can find to coherently describe the behavior of the treatment I received was actually bullying. Whenever I asked about diagnoses or solutions, whenever I asked the staff for help, I was met with sarcasm. For example, don't think you're anything special, we see bigger abruptions than yours, said a midwife when I questioned the incessant stream of medical students who were being sent to me as a case study. Hostility, for example, when I started crying at the fact that I was in so much pain, I was feeling so ill, the midwife said, if you're so desperate to sleep, your husband needs to stay at the hospital. Defensiveness, well, we're short-staffed. Neglect. After my scar burst at 8 p.m., I was left lying in a pool of blood until 2 a.m., despite repeated pleas for help. The doctors then went on to ignore the dehiscence, leading to my contracting untreated E. coli until I was readmitted to hospital for IV antibiotic treatment. The dehiscence of my scar led to my requiring months of daily treatment. The smell from the infected abdomen was repugnant. The children would scream if I picked them up, yet could be passed to a complete stranger who didn't smell and settle immediately. My psychological and emotional state coupled with the horrors of what we'd endured led me to view the children with a degree of at best apathy and at worst contempt. The tissue viability and district nurses were my mainstays. So whilst other mums were out showing off their babies and undertaking buggy fit losses, I was in hospital at home waiting for my daily dressing change 
couldn't socialize because of the foul smell coming from me that nothing could mask. This went on for months. It tore at my self-esteem and made me more reclusive and isolated when I needed connection and support. My marriage almost broke down. After six months of district nurse treatment and imposed isolation, the GP referred me back to the tissue specialist nurses who fitted a vacuum in my scar. So 24 weeks after giving birth, my section scar finally closed. It felt finally like I might be able to begin motherhood. It was only around this time that the babies and I clicked. And then I switched from ambivalence to their activities to an equally unhealthy obsession. My anxiety at this stage soared. I wouldn't sleep in case the babies stopped breathing. I wouldn't leave the house in case they picked up a bug. This escalated to my being too afraid to bring them downstairs. The dog's downstairs, the dog's dirty. So for several weeks, my children were confined to their cots, the sheets of which I would change twice daily to ensure they were sterile. It was only during a moment of utterly broken clarity that I realized I needed help. Google pointed me in the direction of the Birth Trauma Association who navigated me to my GP. The cavalry then reined in. Now, eight years on, I'm still not the woman I used to be. I used to move mountains to achieve a goal. I got pregnant. This experience left me dependent on antidepressants for six years. Although that's over now, I don't have huge amounts of trust for healthcare professionals. And this is despite spending my entire life automatically trusting them. My physical and mental health has been damaged. Cognitive behavioral therapy didn't change this. And the mental health provision for PTSD is still very lacking. For years as a mother, every time the children did something I found frustrating. I wondered if I felt that way because of what had happened. I'm also plagued with sadness that I took so long to bond with them because of the experience. I lost a year. And the slightest thing that's wrong with them, I really have to battle to quell my anxiety. Ever since Millie's anemia was attributed to my failure to breastfeed in the first week of her life, the anxiety and guilt became a structural way of thinking for me. So that's a daily battle. Now, obviously I could list what could have prevented a situation like mine. And I'm aware my experience isn't unique. The question of solving this is so big, but only an open and ongoing dialogue between patients like me and professionals like you can really repair this. We want to see the healthcare system thriving at a time when it's under such great pressure. So if I can answer any questions at the end of this session, I'd be absolutely delighted to. But in the meantime, thank you so much for listening. Thanks for watching this video from the Maternity and Midwifery Forum. For more expert opinion and analysis, hit the button below to subscribe.